How happy the soldier who lives on his pay And spends half a crown out of sixpence a day He fears neither justices, warrants, nor bonds But pays all his debts with the roll of his drums With a rowdy dow rowdy dow rowdy dow dow And he pays all his debts with the roll of his drums June 1780, Buffalo Ford, North Carolina My dear wife it is hard to realize we are now in the fifth year of war. Why we still march to the south is unknown. Each day they only tell us where the next camp will be. The sergeant says he doubts General DeKalb himself knows. Yesterday, we learned General Horatio Gates was coming to take command soon. I pray with all my heart that he can end this war and keep us from getting captured. The food is tolerable. Most of this day, I spent washing my clothes in a river named the Deep. What a fortune I would give if it were Naaman's Creek or the Brandywine, and I knew spring planting had all been done. Give my love to the children, remember me to my father, and above all, keep my memory alive in your heart. Your loving husband, Benjamin Ford. Benjamin Ford, a simple but literate farmer from Brandywine 100, Delaware. He is a continental soldier whose words and deeds are typical of the enlisted men who fought in the long, heroic southern campaign to drive the British from America forever. Benjamin Ford's next letter is about Camden, South Carolina, where, as in other Revolutionary War battles, Half the American army was composed of untrained local men. These raw troops were pitted against finely trained British regulars under the command of the aristocratic Earl Cornwallis. September 1780, Hillsborough, North Carolina. My dear family, as you have undoubtedly heard about the Battle of Camden, I write to let you know your husband and father is still alive. The Lord Almighty surely protected me in recent perils. The night before battle, all I had to eat was green corn, and as there was no rum, we were given molasses instead. The longer we marched, the sicker the men became, owing to the corn and molasses. Resuming our march that night in order to surprise the enemy, we were surprised instead when we met the British marching toward us. The next morning, when battle began, I felt so weak I could hardly stand. Our General DeKalb was killed. He was a very brave man. The next thing I realized was Tarleton's cavalry riding among us. We all ran, how far or how long I cannot tell. But in making my way here to Hillsborough, I found Thomas, David, and about 20 other men from Delaware. My shirt is almost gone, and I lost my shoes while running away. David has a bad wound on the shoulder, but Thomas is safe and sound. Being mindful of harvest, I pray to the Lord Almighty that ours is plentiful and that all of you are well convey what I have told you to my father, your loving husband and father, Benjamin Ford. The Battle of Camden was a crushing defeat for Americans in the South. Except for a few guerrilla fighters, led by Francis Marion and Thomas Sumter, the British swept all resistance from the state of South Carolina. Ragged American troops fled 200 miles into North Carolina to reform an army as best they could. December 16th, 1780, Charlotte, North Carolina. My dearest wife, we built shelter from cornstalks for winter encampment, but now we are marching south again, even further from all I hold dear. Gates has left us and General Nathaniel Green has command. Now they call us light infantry, giving cause for laughter since we carry nothing but our muskets and a blanket for three men together. The weather is cold, but do not be alarmed. 
as I was given new clothes and shoes. We still receive no pay, and the meals are short. In times like these, I regret not having gone to sea with Cousin Matthias, for at least I would have been home at times and might have won prize money for captured ships. Stood witness to a man hanged for deserting. My heart was heavy with pity for the miserable wretch. For if every deserter were caught and hanged, the trees would be bent from Wilmington to Chester. If only word could be gotten to me about the health of the little ones and yourself as well. Each time we march past a burned house or a ruined farm, I pray again there is no burning and pillaging in Delaware. Your loving husband, Benjamin Ford. General Nathaniel Green had been sent south by General Washington with complete trust that if anything could be done about a now desperate situation, Green was the man to do it. His troops were sick, weary, and ill-equipped. Green made a daring, ingenious decision. He would split his small force, about 2,500 men, in the hopes of keeping the enemy on edge and wondering. About half the Americans were sent with General Daniel Morgan to the west and south of the British at Winsboro, South Carolina, while Green himself marched to the south and east of the British with the rest. A perplexed Cornwallis decided to go after the Americans piecemeal, sending Tarleton after Morgan in the west. At a place called Calpin, South Carolina, in the middle of January, 1781, General Morgan defeated the dreaded Colonel Bannister Tarleton in brilliant fashion. Green was overjoyed to hear news of the Americans' first real victory in the South. He immediately ordered his men to march north under the command of General Isaac Uji. The plan was to meet Morgan at Salisbury. The defeat of Tarleton by Morgan was a severe blow to the proud Cornwallis, who wrote in a letter, the late affair has almost broke my heart. More determined than ever to destroy the rebels, Cornwallis began a relentless pursuit of Morgan, which caught the attention of Americans and Europeans alike. Morgan's retreat was really a race from one river to the next, slowed by having to escort 700 British prisoners and captured wagons Morgan nevertheless pressed on as hard as he could, knowing that if Cornwallis were to catch the Americans attempting to cross a river, all might be lost. Somewhere in North Carolina, January 29th, 1781. My dear family, 10 glorious days ago, we beat the British in battle, captured their army, guns, and wagons, General Green surprised everyone when he rode into camp three days ago. He rode across Carolina with only four men for an escort, and he did it in only three days' time. General Morgan is down with the ague and in great pain. I am well, only wet, cold, hungry, and tired. We have been retreating ever since Cowpens, and Cornwallis is pressing upon us. Once again, I am your loving husband and father, Benjamin Ford. British determination was as fierce as that of the Americans. An officer with Cornwallis wrote, Without baggage, necessaries, or provisions of any sort, for officer or soldier, in the most barren, inhospitable, unhealthy part of North America, opposed to the most savage, inveterate, perfidious, cruel enemy, with zeal and with bayonets only, it was resolved to follow Green's army to the end of the world. Hoping every day for reinforcements, 
the weary Americans marched north for almost four weeks in heavy, cold rain. They were too weak and outnumbered to make a stand. At every river crossing, Green had collected boats beforehand, so that while advancing faster than the Americans, the British were always slowed when they reached a rain-swollen river. Either they had to wait for the waters to recede or march many miles to a shallow spot. Near Halifax, Virginia, February 16, 1781. My dear Sarah, I am well and presently out of harm's way. When we first arrived at Guilford, some hundreds of us went marching west to where the British were camped. For five days and nights, our task was to deceive, harry, and delay as we led them to the upper falls of the Dan River, while General Green took our main force to the lower falls. When a message came saying the main force was safely over, I tell you we cheered and huzzahed so loud the British had to know the game was played. The last of our small deception was brought across just as the British arrived at the river. We had all the boats, so they did not cross. I think you must tire, reading always of battle, but such is my existence. Between times, I wonder about life in Brandywine Hundred and whether you took the children for New Year's Day to my father's house as before. With the reward of rum we were given today, I toast you all. With fondest thoughts, I remain your loving husband, Benjamin Ford. Cornwallis was now so short of supplies and his men were so tired and dispirited that three days later he marched back to Hillsboro. Green crossed back into North Carolina. Militia began arriving. By the 14th of March, he moved about 5,000 men to Guilford Courthouse, where he knew the ground well. Meanwhile, Cornwallis led about 2,300 men to Deep River Settlement, some 12 miles away. On the morning of the 15th of March, the British came up the new garden road. Then in the afternoon, they formed their lines during an artillery duel. To the beat of their drummers, the British advanced toward the first American line. The battle had begun. Through the woods I'll go, through the bogs and mire, I'll travel many roads. But none to my desire. Oh, lolly day, oh, the lolly o day. Oh, that I were where I would be, then would I be where I am not. But I am where I must be, where I would be, I cannot. By dawn the next day, the soggy battlefield was strewn with dead and wounded from the previous day's battle. The rain of the night before continued for three days. With the help of neighboring Quakers, the British cared for casualties of both sides. Finally, on the third day, Cornwallis led a tattered, discouraged British army off to Wilmington for desperately needed rest and supplies. Green pursued Cornwallis for several days. He then abruptly turned southward and re-entered South Carolina to carry on the war against the British troops still there. After several more battles in South Carolina, each of which Green technically lost, as at Guilford Courthouse, the British were forced further and further back. Six months after the Battle of Guilford Courthouse, the British controlled only the cities of Charleston and Savannah in the Carolinas and Georgia. 
Several weeks after the Battle of Guildford, Private Ford was to write, April 7th, 1781, Shallow Ford, North Carolina. My dear wife, you will hear of our defeat at Guildford Courthouse, but tell my father that for some days we have been pursuing the British and are in no way defeated. A great number of us feel that except for certain circumstances, we could have beat the British. The very next day, we were ready to fight them again. Believe me when I tell you, we were greatly heartened by the reappearance of the militia, for in times past, they melted away into the countryside and were never seen again. Now, you know, soldiers are a superstitious lot, but it seems the course of events is changing and becoming favorable to our cause at last. How fortunate we are that General Green will risk nothing to satisfy mere vanity or custom, least of all our lives. Now spring is upon us as the sixth year of this seemingly interminable war begins. Once again we are marching south when I think always of you and the farm. I yearn to know how the children have grown and if they will know me when I'm at last allowed to return. I am with you in thoughts and rely on divine providence to reunite us safe and sound before another spring. Your loving husband, Benjamin Ford. While resting and gathering supplies, Cornwallis decided the way to conquer the whole South was to gain control of Virginia, a great storehouse of men and provisions. The battle at Guilford Courthouse was one link in a chain of events that shaped the outcome of our war for independence. Here, the British lost men and momentum, and Cornwallis' strategy was changed. In the last week of April, Cornwallis took the ill-fated road that led to Virginia and Yorktown and British surrender. Five years later, in 1786, and heavily in debt, the valiant general Nathaniel Green died at age 43, leaving his widow with five young children. Many years later, in 1818, 60-year-old Benjamin Ford applied for a pension as an invalid. Ford was granted a pension of $8 per month. He cares not a whit about how the world goes. His king finds his quarters, his money and clothes. He laughs at all sorrow whenever it comes and rattles away with the roll of his drum. With a rowdy-dow, 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 row. And he pays all his debts with the roll of his drum. Now the drum is his glory, his joy, his delight. It leads him to pleasure as well as to fight. No girl when she hears it, though ever so glum, but she picks up her tatters and follows the drum with a rowdy dow, rowdy dow, rowdy dow, row. And he pays all his debts with the roll of his drums. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to help us produce more compelling historical content like this, please like, comment below, and share this video with fellow history buffs. And of course, be sure to subscribe to help keep history happening.